Sure. You ready for action? Yeah, man. Hey, I'm Isaac, and this is my good friend Ash. We've been friends for years, and we both shoot Sony, but we haven't caught up in a while, just we've both been so busy with work, life, and relationships. So today we're gonna to go through what Ash is shooting with in early 2024. All right, Ash, do you wanna tell us a few words about what you do? Yeah, so like Isaac said, my name's Ash. I'm a freelance photographer and videographer on the Gold Coast. Uh, I specialize, I guess you could say, my niche would be fitness and fashion, uh, and over the last, three to five years, that's kind of been what I've been doing. So yeah, it's been um, it's been cool. Switching over to video has been kind of a big task, but we're here for it, so. How much video and photo do you do? Like what's the breakdown? Um, currently, I probably would say 60, 40 to video now. That's probably the breakdown. Uh, I mean, for me, I like photography is just, what I grew up with and what I love doing, and I do love video, um, but that's just the demand. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I love photo for how easy it is. Like we'd go down to the park, I'd shoot an hour of photos, we get home, half an hour later I've delivered the photos to you, I've done some basic edits and stuff, yeah. whereas video feels like so much more pre-production, so much more post-production, I do love it, but like my first love was photography, so like I feel you 100% on yeah, that. Yeah, no 100%, I think you're right, like just the, the scope of like a one hour video shoot has so much more pre and post comparatively to, you could essentially almost rock up with your camera and take photos uh, in, you know, in, the, in a sort of a dumbed down version of that. Yeah, yeah, and then for context, so you do photo and video, roughly what are you shooting? Like are you shooting Hollywood movies or are you shooting Instagram reels on the video side? And then photos, is it mainly social media content or is it more staged portraits or what sort of stuff? Uh, most of my work comes from like a social aspect. Yeah. Uh, so Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, depending on what platform uh, the client I'm working with. Um, and then on a professional side of things, I guess you could say like, um, you know, we'd do, you know, talking headshots uh, for video or um, ad work for them for top of funnel stuff and um, yeah, all sorts of different stuff like that. Yeah, so mainly social and yeah. web. Yeah, cool, cool. All right, do you want to flip out your gear and show us yeah. what you're working with? Okay, we're already very different. I just have a normal camera bag with padding. I don't have any of this sort of stuff. Yeah, um, this is obviously a big investment in Pelican. If you guys know Pelican, they definitely don't miss you with the bill. Um, so What's this cost? I have no context for the uh, case. I actually, I kind of cheap out because most of my stuff I try and buy on the second hand market. Amen. Yeah, um, I think, you know, as a photographer or a videographer, you also have to understand that like, you kind of have to be frugal at times, depending on what it is. Um, but I think these list just the case without anything in them around that $400 mark or 450 mark. Um, life hack, if you go on Etsy, you can buy an internal, but that's custom made and you can pick a color instead yes. of the Pelican one. Is that what you're running? That's what I'm running. Okay, yep. So inside here we have, this is my day-to-day -day photography kit. Um, so if it's not, um, say I'm not trekking or hiking or anything like that, this comes with me for every photo shoot. So this is the photo setup? This is the photo setup. Okay, yep, yeah, cool. All right, so what do we got here? So it, camera body wise, I have the A7R5. Uh, that's my main photo camera, uh, which replaced this, which is my A7R4. Um, always been an R user. I did have a three, but I don't know, just the um, heavy megapixels and the color spectrums on the Rs, I always feel respond better to the sort of work I'm doing. Um, inside lens, lens wise, I have the 24 to 70 G Master Mark II. Which I know you got a great price for second hand. No, this one, no, I have two 24 to 70s. Oh, that's so I have a, nice. a G1, I have a, a G Master Mark I and a, a Mark II, um, which has been, my G1's actually been borrowed, but my, my Mark II lives on my camera. Uh, I have the Sigma 50mm 1.4 Art, the 85 Sony 1.8, um, the Godox V1 Flash, and the Sony G Master Mark I 70 to 200 2.8. Awesome. Yep. All right, we'll chuck that on the ground cool. and we'll split that piece by piece and have a quick chat about them. Sweet. So I guess we'll start with camera body. So you said you <clears> went R3, R4, R5. Um, my first R was the original A7R. 
Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what's the, like, not spec-wise, mm -hmm. but what was the biggest difference you noticed upgrading between them? Like usability or image quality or, like, what did you love? Uh, image, yeah, image, uh, like, um, yeah, image quality for sure. So when I had the R, obviously at the time it was, like, stunning, um, great. That one doesn't have, like, any IBIS whatsoever, so it's just, like, a 61 megapixel camera yeah just, um, high shutter speeds baby yeah. yeah so that was just i think it just sort of ticked all the boxes for me at the time the a7 when it first came out wasn't really doing too much for me that i felt like it was worth the investment um from the r i went to the a7 III, and when that launched that camera was probably one of the turning points i think for just cameras in general yeah like in mirrorless mirrorless times so um, You're saying the A7 III? Yeah, the A7 III. Yeah, oh, III. dude, I didn't even give a shit about Sony. Yeah. And then A7 III came out, YouTube blew up with it, yeah. justifiably, because mm. it was so good at focus, so good at video, so good at photo, so yeah. well priced. Yeah. And that was like around the time I decided to leave Canon, yeah. which I actually left for Fuji. Yeah. But it's just mirrorless cameras in general, Canon was so far behind, and A7 III was the, uh, yeah, A7 III was the nail on the ground. Yeah, I think it's the, the benchmark that it's set for everybody else, that that camera was the, sort of like definition of hybrid. Yeah, yeah. You know, like it was great for video. It was a great photo camera. Um, yeah, and it ticked a lot of boxes, man. That thing was that thing was unreal. So I went from that to the R4. So then my A7 III just became my video camera at the time. Um, and then my R4 was just my main photo camera. That was probably at the time I was getting, it was sort of about 80-20 where I was getting asked to do video work and then I was still doing way more photo work than video. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> this thing has been an absolute workhorse. Actually, there are times that I actually prefer the color spectrum on the R4, which is why it's still in the kit comparatively to the R5. But I definitely do notice between the two, even when you set them to the same white balance, they are different. Yeah, I have the same problem with Fuji. So yeah. we went from the 24 to the 26 to the 40 megapixel sensors. Yeah. Every time it's different. Mm. So when my wife and I are shooting, if we have two of the 24 megapixel sensors, I can just copy and paste the Lightroom edits yeah. and it's just perfect. As soon as one of us is using a different sensor, yeah. then I'm like, okay, I need to do all the 24 megapixel photos because I can copy and paste the edits and then go through the second sensor, copy and paste the edits. Yeah. So something so nice about having the same sensor, 100%. even if it's a different body, yeah, yeah, just yeah. when the color science matches. Yeah, um, but... Uh, having owned the R5 now for close to a year, I've just really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed the video capabilities on it. It took me a little while to, to get my head around it, but yeah, it's um, it's just, man, they're, they're such easy cameras to use. Sweet, so I noticed you got a cage on this. Mm -hmm. Is that just so you can vertically mount it or is there some other reason you got a cage on it? Uh, yeah, for vertical mount. Yeah, that was, yeah, pure and simple. Um, no other reason really. Cool. Then it was just lying around and I thought, why not? Yeah, so that stays in the cage? Yeah, it just stays in the cage. Yeah, so too yeah. easy. All right, now show us your lenses. You'll have to excuse the fact that there's no lens cap on this. Um, the joys of having multiple kits and having to find them. Uh, 24 to 70, G Master. I've, for the longest time, was always kind of just a prime, like prime uh, lens user. I love a 35, I love a 50, I think everybody starts on a 50. You gotta start with a 35, like everyone needs a 35. Yeah, I think I think the, like, if I had to take one lens anywhere, it's always gonna be a 35. Yeah. Um, the, the 24 to 70, because I do a lot of e-commerce work and, you know, sometimes uh, you need that variability, I just love this lens. It just works so hard and, yeah. It's, there's not much that I can say it's about it. It's your workhorse it. Yeah, lens. it's my workhorse. Yeah, I'm the same, my Fuji yeah. zoom lens. Yeah. Just when you need to smash out a million photos at a yeah. photo shoot, you just use it, it works fine, like yeah. gets the job done. And when, you know, like companies and businesses and clients, they're so content hungry. You don't, you're trying to maximize the time that you have in the higher space yeah. or you're, when you're on a shoot that like, sometimes we don't have the luxury of going, you know what, this would look great on an 85 let me just switch it out. Or this would look great on a 17 where I'm like, no, you know what? We're gonna be moving around. Let's just get this, put that on there. And I think for, for photo and video, it's just like a no brainer. Yeah. Really. yeah. Yeah, I find when I shoot two cameras for a photo shoot, I, and one's got a 35, one's got an 85, if I'm shooting with one of them, even just to have to take three steps back, grab the other camera off the desk mm -hmm. is still 
I wouldn't always do it where I know if I could just do this, yeah. I would do it. So yeah. I think it doesn't matter, like even if you have two cameras on you, yeah. it's still more effort. And so I, I fully get it. Yeah, I think um, it's sort of a love-hate relationship because sometimes I feel super lazy with this lens. Um, but at the same time, because I feel like when, you're, when you've got like a, a prime, you kind of have to work that a little bit harder yeah, to get 100%. what you want, right? So you, you're kind of cognitively driving your creative side with that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I get that when I'm shooting anamorphic. I'm not used to something this wide. Mm. And so I'm like, oh, I need to do more set design because yeah. stuff that usually wouldn't be included in the photo is. is yeah. And so I'm just like, yeah, you don't realize how lazy you get with this, yeah, but lazy is also efficient. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, so it's a fine line. Sweet. All right, what's next? Um, this is a recent addition. This is, look, right there. This is the 70 to 200 F 2.8 G Master Mark I. Um, I don't have enough money to buy a Mark II because they're very expensive. Uh, I picked this up secondhand, and like I said before, you're just gonna be frugal. Now, I have never really been a huge 70 to 200 fan. I've never been like desperate to own one. Yeah. And I know everyone, like every, when you talk cameras, everyone's like the holy trinity is the 16 to 35, the 24 to 70, and the 70 to 200. For me, I was kind of always happy to get away with like an 85. Um, never felt like I really needed a 70 to 200 in the kit. Then I've used it on a handful of shoots and went, I probably need one. Yeah, yeah. And, but I still didn't want to make a massive investment. Um, and that's probably a good, like, a, a key thing for, for young people to understand when you're getting in the game. Like, it's always nice to have the best gear, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have to have the best gear. Yeah. 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 I've got the 7200 F4, mm. bought secondhand as well at a great price on Marketplace for the exact same reasons you said. Mm. Like, I wanted a bit extra range. I can get some shots I otherwise couldn't get but I honestly don't use it enough to almost justify it. If I had to get rid of one lens, it would probably be that lens. Yeah. It's a great lens. It does awesome stuff, gives me a unique look, gets me shots I otherwise couldn't get, but it doesn't come out much. Whereas yeah. my 35, my 85, my 20, 20 mil, those all get used all the time. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So this is absolutely my fifth best lens. Yeah. So I, yeah. But yeah, amazing shots, especially when you're in a big outdoor area, you can get like nice compression, yeah. zoom right in on something without getting too close. And it, feels nice because people are so used to wide angle iPhone yep. footage. If you just get any shot at 200 mil, it just looks different than getting close. Yeah, 100%. I found um, recently taking on some clients that do like running or outdoor sports. That's the sure I've seen of like yeah. track work. Yeah. yeah, so for me, having something like this was uh, becoming a necessity for me. Uh, what I actually really enjoy using it for is doing e-commerce. So I can shoot uh, a wide shot at 70, get myself set up for a wide shot or a full body shot, I should say, at 70 mil, and then being able to zoom in and still maintaining where I am and getting a tighter shot for e-commerce. So, you know, where, where you can have that sort of variability. So yeah, it's, um, I didn't think I would love it as much as I do. Yeah. And now I find reasons to use it, which yeah. is a good thing, I think. Yeah, so I'm related to Sony for video. I used to shoot weddings 10 years ago and it was always a two person job. So it'd be my wife and I, or my friend and I, and I'd always just grab the 7200, run around with that on my 5D Mark II for the whole day. They'd be running around with a 24 to 70 and just every photo I had looked better, not because I'm a better photographer at all. It just had that beautiful bride, best day of her life, 200 mil, beautiful background blur. Yeah. And it just always looked better than the wide angle shot. So like there is some magic in these yeah, kind of lenses. Yeah, no, 100%, yeah. Uh, Sigma 35 1.4 Art. This is the V2 of that. Um, whatever that is. Um, this is the V2. So the difference this has is it's got the aperture ring, which the previous model didn't, which I actually owned. Um, but just like Isaac says, 35, there's just magic to 35 mil 1.4. I don't know what it is. It just always looks great. It's versatile that you can do kind of street photography. You can do portraits. You can do fitness. I mean, yeah, it's by far my favorite focal length. Yeah, 
I'd say of every prime lens, this can do wide and tight. So if you just have to run around a gym or any environment, you can use this. You can get wide shots of like five or 10 people. And then if there's a small can of something, you can get right up close because of the minimum focus distance and fill up the whole frame with that. As soon as you go into like 50 mil, I feel it's so limiting. If you're indoors, you can't fit in the environment enough. You can see a part of a room, but you can't see a room. And if you go any wider, say if we went to 24 or something, you can get some nice wide angle shots, but you can't really get those close ups without getting a lot of distortion. So if you only get one prime lens, I'd suggest a 35. I've got the 1.8, which isn't quite as bokeh-licious as this is, but um, I chose that because I felt like I'd get slightly better autofocus and IBIS performance from a native lens. But I think any 35 mil prime would be amazing. Yeah, um, I think you're right. Like 24 for me in video, I feel like is just wide enough. Yeah. Yeah, like, but this, if you could take one prime to do a job and you yeah. didn't know what the job was. Yeah, it would be a 35. Yeah, yeah. Down, like not down. that that's a realistic situation. No, 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 like no. go shoot something, no further information. Yeah. You can only take a prime. Yeah, yeah. cool. Um, yeah, 35. I mean, my my recommendation is just go get one. Like they're just, they're just phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Uh, 50 mil Sigma Art 1.4. I'm a massive like fan of the art range from Sigma. Um, again, like you just gotta be frugal with it. You, for the trade-off, like look, for video, these things aren't as good personally, comparatively to like a native Sony lens. For autofocus? For or autofocus, or yeah. I find that um, I get a lot, especially with my 50 mil, it, um, it drops in and out, like yeah. focus wise. Like um, it's, current, it's constantly hunting. Uh, I don't get it so much on the 35 and the 24, but probably because they're just that, that bit wider. But um, for portraits, for any sort of detail stuff, for me, this thing, absolutely killer. Um, yeah, great lens. Sweet, my feedback would be, I've got the Sony 50 millimeter 1.8, which feels so cheaply made, it would come free in a Happy Meal or something like that, like it's absolute garbage. But I put that on my camera when I'm shooting video and it looks beautiful and I get great autofocus. So this is a great option, also just the Sony 50 millimeter 1.8. You could probably just walk down the street and find one chucked in a bin or something. They're just, they're worthless, but so good. Uh, the cheapest probably lens in my kit is and the that, only one we both own. Yeah, this this thing I think super underrated. The eighty five one point eight from Sony. Like you can go to a one point four, and it would look really really nice. But I feel like one point eight at eighty five, super super buttery. Yeah. I've never wanted more background blur. Like I've never shot something at one point eight and gone. I wish this background was blurrier, mm. or I wish I could get more light in. Like yeah, I'm yeah. not shooting somewhere that dark that I need the one point four. Yeah, hundred percent. And there's so much subject separation anyway. Yeah. And I feel like if I wanted more, the 1.4 probably wouldn't give me enough anyway. It'd no. be get the subject away from the background or yeah. change your composition or something. Yeah. Like yeah. there's not enough of a difference to justify it for video. I'm sure in photo, maybe the 1.4 is way sharper or yeah. something. I mean, I use this for a long time. Like I think everyone sort of goes through phases with lenses. Like the 85 never left my camera at one point. I okay. was just like so for obsessed. For photo or video? Yeah, for photo. Okay, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm the same for photo, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was just obsessed with it. It was just like, everything looks great in this in this lens, so, yeah. Okay, yeah, so if you could build a one lens kit, a two lens kit, or a three lens kit, mm -hmm. what would they be? Just off the top of your head, general purpose videography recommendations. For video, uh, one lens kit, uh, 24 to 70. Yep. Hands down. Um, I'd go 24 to 105, which 24. is almost the same thing. Yep, yep. Um, I'm a sucker to just, have as much not natural light in, so stopping down to like 2.8 if yeah, I yeah. can, yeah. Yeah, I um, want 70 to 105, yeah. and I want OIS. Yeah, yeah, so, of course. So yeah. I'm, I'm sacrificing a stop for that, yeah. but I feel like, yeah, we both agree, zoom yeah. lens if you got one. Yeah, yeah, 100%. If you're going single lens, like I did the New Zealand trip, uh, just with the 2470. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All um, right, two lens kit. Two lens kit, for me, what I have, I would probably say 17 to 28, and then still the 24 to 70. Okay, yeah, I'd go 24 to 105 yep. and a 35 mil. Cause I feel like at 70 to 100 mil, F4, F2.8, you get enough background blur. Yep. Whereas if you're shooting something a bit wider, I just want a bit more subject separation. Yep. And I'll choose that over an ultra wide lens or yeah. a telephoto or something. Yeah, yeah. So 35 and a zoom lens. I think also you probably do a lot more headshot sort of stuff. Talking heads, yeah. yeah, yeah whereas yeah. for me, it's like, I want that extra width 
because I might be in a gym or a small location yeah. or like just the grand scape of the outdoors or something like that where yeah. I want that real big establishing wide yeah. vibe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now you get to add a third lens. Third. I'd probably go the 85. Yeah. Just to have just sort of those three. I, I don't use my 7200 for video yet anyway. Yeah. But yeah, the 85 just because I, you can get a really nice like... Um, I think like close up shot. Yeah. 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 That's the lens I use the most for fitness photography yeah. and family portraits. Yeah, 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 yeah. Everything looks good on an 85. It's, yeah. You can't get a bad shot. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Sweet. All right. So this is your video setup. Uh, yeah. So this is my A7S III. Um, at the moment, it's got the 24 1.4 on it from Sigma. It's an art lens as well. Um, yeah. Just small rig cage. Um, yeah. These things are awesome. Uh, I just, yeah, not much to really to say about it apart from like, it's just a killer video camera. Yeah. yeah. So what's your rigging? Cause I've got my FX3 in a very similar cage, NATO rail at top, tripod mount at the bottom. Mm -hmm. I'm usually seven inch monitor on top yep. cause I'm almost 40 and I just found out you're slightly older than me, <laughs> but I'm just like with a seven inch monitor, I can tell if I'm in focus, I can see my framing so much better when I'm outdoors, everything looks good. And I swear Sony screens look garbage. Yep. Like when I used to have a Canon or when I pull out my Fuji, mm. I could show clients the back of the camera and they'd be like, wow, that's a beautiful photo. Yep. Whereas these always look washed out and crap and I just don't trust them. So I need a monitor on there if I'm yep. shooting video, yep. not even for the tools, just to see it decent quality version of what yeah. I'm shooting. Um, it's a pretty much non-negotiable for me to have a monitor. Yeah. I just use the Atomos uh, Shinobi 5 inch. Yeah, yeah. Um, only because I have absolutely no idea when it comes to what the difference is between a good monitor and like an average monitor might be. Yeah. Um, that just seemed to be the one that ticked a fair amount of boxes for me. Dude. My best friend, Daniel, he's got that. Mm. And I've got all my small HD monitors that are way more expensive. I've got a couple of Holy Land monitors and stuff. So we just laid them all out on this table and compared mm. them. And it was like practically as good. Like I, I went in going, oh, this is a cheap one. It's like a Ninja 5 with his balls cut off. Yeah. I was expecting it to not be very good. Yeah. I was like, oh yeah, this, this can play with all the big boys sort yeah. of thing. So I'm amazed at how good that is. And like I've got an old small HD Focus 5 and it looks garbage compared to the Shinobi. So I'm yeah. like, there are much better monitors but that's all you need and I'd be happy using that. Yeah, I think for, um, for everything that I need, for me, the, the monitor is just really the reference, right? Like, it's just like, have I got the shot? Does it, you know, am I getting exposed, you know, close enough to what I need? Being able to run like a light light on there just to get an idea of what you're working with. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's, I run that top handle. Um, so you go top handle, then monitor on top? Yep, top handle, monitor on top. Okay, yeah, yep. And then I run a small cage that I can grab out. Um, I run this. Oh, baby. Yeah, so. Did you copy me? Yeah, I think so. Actually, like uh, it was either you. I, I made a video about this years ago, but yeah. I don't know if you even saw it. No, no, I definitely would have watched yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, it, between you and um, DS, I'll, uh, Caleb at DSLR Video. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I really. I love that guy. Yeah, I really liked, I wanted something that sort of looked a bit more menacing when it came to clients, I guess. Like, so yeah. you're not just turning up with whatever. Obviously, I power my monitor and my camera both from uh, my V-mount battery. So, um, you know, having the quick release um, unit, it can just go on there, boom. And then if I need to run and gun, just go straight on the gimbal. Yeah. yeah. And I think the, the, the key to these sorts of setups is just honestly like, getting it weighted yeah. to how you feel comfortable. All right, weight check. All right, yeah, that's, that's very well balanced. Mm. So I originally built this rig when I had a Fujifilm X-T3 that mm. doesn't have IBIS. And as soon as I put a 24 to 70 type lens on the front, which is one of the bigger lenses I had, mm. and then this on the back, the whole thing felt so stable. It yeah. felt like IBIS. Whereas I found is when I was shooting handheld, because your wrist is always fighting that heavy front weight and there's just less weight and inertia. Mm -hmm. So aside from you having infinite battery life, I'm like, this just feels so much more stable, even though you've already got IBIS. Yeah, 100%. Um, yeah, I just, you want a simple, not like convoluted setup. There are things that I could definitely maximize a little bit more on this, but um, yeah, it does the job. Um, so how often are you using this rigged with a battery versus 
shooting video without the rig? Oh, pretty much all the time now. Yeah, and do you have the monitor folded in so you can't see it, or do you have it flipped out? Uh, yeah, I have it set up usually out to the side, and then I have it as DSLR a DSLR video to, shooter yeah, style? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, just yeah. depending on what it is. I have the screen show up as red, so yeah, yeah. Uh, so just so I can monitor if it's yeah. recording. Yeah, because I just find I can't touch track to focus with my external monitor, obviously. Yep. And it's usually not a problem, but so I need the monitor somewhere so that yep. in the event I need to touch track, it is there. Yeah, no, for yeah. sure. Having that access, like, uh, you know, if you're doing a talking headshot and you just want to make sure it's all good, like, I guess that's the cool thing about the Sony system is just like tap it, boom, leave it and let yeah. it do, do its thing. And do you have the output clean where it's just the raw image or do you have like your on-screen Sony settings menus and stuff on there? Uh, clean. Yeah, yeah, same. Yeah, yeah, same. So I, I, I want still... this to be clean. If I want to see my shutter speed, yeah. I'll look at the screen. 100%. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're pretty similar. Yeah. And what are your favorite monitor tools? I never use focus peaking. I always have a LUT on. I usually have waveforms on. I always have audio levels on. But looks like I don't use most of the tools. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm I'm very similar. Um, I do a little bit of um, oh, what's it called? Like focus peaking just distracts me. Yeah, yeah. I'm focus, to, yeah. yeah, focus peaking. I, I this is probably really dumb, but I trust my eye on the monitor. Like, yeah. It, it, for 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 focus. Um, but in terms of like exposure, I probably use oh, what's it called? Zebras? Not zebra. The one false color. False color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do a little bit of false color if I'm a little bit worried. Yeah. Um, but outside of that, with the LUT on, I feel pretty confident that we're most of the way there. Yeah. And when I first got my FX3 and FX6, I would check the waveforms and try and get skin tones exactly right. Mm. And it'd be like technically correct. And then a bunch of other times, I just eyeball it because they're running and gunning. And whenever I get the footage back, if it looked good on the back of my monitor, it always came out better than if it was technically correct. Yeah, I think you know? so too. I think people get caught up in the technicality of it. Yeah. I've, I've got like, I don't know, there's just some, you, you have to trust your eye. That's the whole point of like yeah. photography and videography and like what makes you different from everybody else is what you're looking for, not what somebody tells you in a book or like is what, you know, scientifically, yeah, sure, I'm sure, I'm sure it's right. But man, I've seen plenty of stuff out there that... That is definitely not what people's skin tone yeah. looks like. Yeah, so. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. All right, so what accessories have you got? For my video setup, obviously my top handle. Yeah. Uh, I got that here. So do you ever shoot video without the monitor? No. Yeah, yeah, same. No. Uh, unless I'm like super run and gun and I've got no time, then yeah. yeah. But top handle, small rig top handle. Yeah, I got the same one. Um, if I'm doing vertical, content i actually have like the this newer accessory which just um clamps onto the side of my camera and then i can run a monitor it took me ages to figure out how to get i didn't want a monitor like out to the side i don't like i do what you do i just slide my monitor from the top from the top to here, to here yeah. yeah so i have the small rig mounting piece here and i run my monitor like here so i don't actually run a top handle when I shoot vertically, yeah. um, I just run a side handle. Um, there's not very many times that I've actually had to a need for a top handle for vertical stuff. Yeah. Um, a recent acquisition is this small rig side handle with what I've been looking for for ages is the quick release yes. um, handle that actually spins. So what I just, boom, it's on there straight into vertical yeah. if i need to like if we were sort of switching between the two at least i can use the handle if need be but um yeah just super convenient um before i had to like change the mounting piece like multiple times to get it the way i wanted to yeah um whereas this is just a lot of it is just breaking it down and being able to be accessible for different um different things yeah um i run most of the time, DJI mics, just the version ones. Yeah. So that's just those guys there. They've been really good. Um, I've got the Rode one, but I've only got a single, so having those for multiple yeah. clients is really nice. Um, and what about ND? ND wise, I run, so I run a Tide Optics. Okay, so I haven't spent a whole lot of money on an ND because I wasn't sure how much I use it, and now I live for them. Um, 
But this is a Tide Optics ND, it's variable. Uh, it looks pretty trashed right now. But um, yeah, variable ND, uh, does a job for me. I feel pretty happy with it. Like most of the stuff that I um, do seems to do the job for it. I also use their CineSoft or what they, like a 1.4. Um, cheap. Yeah. Get the job done. So you done. just have step up rings on all your lenses to. Yeah, I've that. got. Yeah, most of my most of my other lenses are usually like a sixty-seven mil. So I just. Okay. Use, yeah. I have one step up ring and just run it on there. But yeah, yeah, pretty simple. Not a lot of money, but I do want to invest in them. But I also then want to upgrade my camera. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So what are your plans for this year, gear wise? Um, this year, I uh, finally made the decision to pull the trigger on an FX6. Yep. So that will be probably after I get back from Singapore, pull the yep. trigger on that. Are you um, getting rid of a camera to finance that, or are you keeping what you've got and just adding one? I will be adding, yeah, I yeah. think. Yeah, sweet. Um, I think for me, especially like, depending on what the project is, I'm generally primarily the first shooter photography wise. Yeah. So I need to have, I probably don't have as much need for a second photography camera now, but if I got the FX6 and the S3, they're basically useless if my R5 breaks down. Yeah, yeah. So I need something. Yeah. So the R4, I'm just happy to keep in the kit. I don't need to get rid of it. It yeah. still, still does a job. Um, where the S3, I feel people will always talk about like it being very similar to FX3 and the FX6, but I feel like when I talk to people like yourself or other friends who own the FX6, like it's different. Yeah. And whether or not that's just like, you know, um, be, whether it's just sort of, what is it? What's the word I'm looking for? I don't know if the clients would notice the difference yeah. in the footage. Yeah. But the experience of using it yeah, is more what you're talking about. Yeah, the experience is different. The, the, you just get something out of it that I don't think the, the S3 does. And let's be honest, it is a $10,000 camera versus a $5,000 camera. Yeah. It can't just be the same thing. Yeah. Like, let's be honest. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, that would be, I feel pretty happy lens wise, but camera wise, that would be the next next big thing. And, and you know, just as much like, it's not always just about the camera. Like there's all the other kit that goes into it. It's yeah. the lights, it's the, the mics, it's the monitors, it's just upgrading all those. Yeah, things. and even just pre-production, all that sort of stuff that yeah. goes into it, choosing a location. Yeah, 100%, kind of stuff. yeah, for sure. That's, that's probably a big focus for myself and the guys that I work with is just like, we want to be better storytellers. And I think that's what's massive in the industry now is just how, like, there's a lot of people who are very good at post-production and editing and just throwing a lot of things. Like, it's so simple now. Like, you can literally import 10 clips into CapCut and it'll do it for you. And there's heaps of cool transitions and stuff like that. There's no substance to that. Yeah. It's just, um, uh, it's just all for show. And I think what you're finding at least for me anyway, is that brands are having to work harder to tell their story instead of just having something that's bright and flashy. And um, They need good content, they need not good just content. content. Yeah, and it yeah. needs to be consistent. It just can't be some kid who whipped up something, which look, there's lots of brands that do that. Yeah. Um, but for me, the brands that stand out, the brands that are progressing, the brands that are growing, they're the ones that tell their story in the best way. Yeah. Yeah, I, f I find for me, I don't judge any of that content. If some 18 year old kid just got his A7S III, runs into a gym with a 35 mil prime, gets some shaky handheld footage, cuts it together to, to some fast beat. I was like, I don't love it. It's not what I want to do, but also it's probably exactly what the client wanted. They just mm -hmm. wanted some gym content for this week. Yeah. And if he can do it, have some fun doing it, the customer's happy, even if I think it's not the best, it's yeah. kind of, that's the reality of where we are, where yeah. everyone needs content every week. Mm -hmm. And I want to be above that, but I'm not trashing yeah, what you know, those people are doing. No, 100%. Yeah. I think, and, and that's just, I think as a creator, as a photographer, as a videographer, like this stuff, I'm sure you've shot and I've shot, you know, where you, I look back at it and I'm just like, wow, what was I thinking there? But at the time, yeah, that was like, I mean, teal and orange. I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm Christopher Nolan, look yeah. at me. Yeah, yeah. yes, 100%. <laughs> you know? Like, I mean, for me, like, uh, when I was working with, at the start of my sort of career, working with um, 
a big time influencer, it was just all teal and orange. It was yeah. like things couldn't be more orange and things couldn't be more teal. Yeah. And I look and at that. That was the most cinematic. Yeah, <laughs> that was the that was it. You know, if you weren't doing that, but for, for now yeah, when if you didn't I look, look like at you were it, covered in Cheetos. Yeah, it's it, not, yeah. Now when I look at it, I'm like, man, that's terrible. And like for me, the the biggest key for me is now just making things look the truest it can be and then adding your little bit of flair to it. Yeah, if I can tell that it's been heavily color graded, mm. it's less what I'm into now. Yep. I want color grading to get the mood and feel, mm. but not heavy handed. Yeah, no, 100%. All right, awesome. So if you've got some tips, whether it's on gear purchasing, running a business, being creative, staying motivated, just anything, I'm sure we've all got a thousand random tips, but if you're just gonna throw out a couple of tips for a minute, what would be your things? Uh, okay, so the biggest tip, the two, probably the two that I sort of live by the most is go out and create, like hands down. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter. I know there's a lot of talking about niching and then, you know, like I think there is pros to niching in your, in your genre and finding your feet in something, you know, whether it's fitness, whether it's weddings, whether it's product photography. For me, when I started photography, I was like, man, it felt so small, but when you realize it, it's so huge. Yeah. Like you can, a trucking business would, would require photography. Yeah, yeah. You know, or, you know, tech product, or there's so, there's such a grand scope of things that require photography or videography. Um, so I would just go and shoot. I didn't know, like I never was into shooting fitness. I always liked urban stuff. Yeah, yeah. I was too, I was too much. I of loved a, your urban stuff, man. Yeah, I was too much of a of a scaredy cat to do any like cool building shit that a lot of people like blew up doing. Yeah, but like I enjoyed taking fashion into urban spots and sort of clashing those two things together. Yeah. That's where I sort of started, um, and then people got into fitness, got me into fitness because I was bringing that sort of edginess to like a gym, which yeah. I don't think a lot of people were doing probably at the time. Yeah. Um, so that would be my first tip is just to go out and create and create with just everyone that you, that is willing to hang out with you yeah. to do it, right? Because then you'll find things that you really like, you'll find things that you don't like, you find the people who inspire you and the people who, you know, that, that you're not interested in. I mean, for me, be, like seeing people do different things, I appreciate it and go, Man, I really, I, I really wish I could do product photography to a high level. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, so there's different subgenres to that. So that's why I would just say go out and get creative. Yeah, and I'll add to that. When I first started, I got a 300D in 2006, and I just shot a bit of everything. So I just had a couple of friends that were girls. I'm like, oh, can I just take photos of you? They didn't know how to model. I didn't know how to take photos. Mm. We sort of worked it out. And then one of my friends was getting married. So I just went and shot that. And if you've never done a wedding before, it's literally every genre. Like the close-up of the ring, you're literally doing product photography. And then the ceremony itself is 100% event photography. But the posed photos afterwards are literally posed photos because you're yeah. telling them what to do. Yeah. So there's just, and then you do landscapes of the whole thing. So it's a bit of everything. And then not like I jump into other genres. Some selling a house so I do real estate photography for my friend and I found that I'd learned something in each of those genres that would help me in other genres so even when I'm doing a fitness shoot now my fast pace keep it moving that I learned during weddings so we didn't spend six hours in the pose photos keeping the energy up those sort of things those skills transition there are certain portrait things that transitioned into fitness so even if you're doing something completely unrelated you'll probably find out more about what you're capable of or you'll upskill yourself even if you're not aware of it and it'll have knock-on effects in other creative areas yeah, definitely finding those strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. For sure, for sure. My second tip uh, is like gear orientated. Um, buy things when you definitely know you need them, not just for the sake of buying them. Because like I've done, I've bought things where I'm like, cool, I need this. I bought a $500 light meter that I never use and now I can't find. Bro, I did the same thing. I sold it a year ago after not using it for four years. Yeah. I was lucky because I bought secondhand, sold secondhand. Mm. So I got five years of a light meter sitting here I didn't use for zero. Yeah. So it's good, I learned something. I yeah. learned I don't use light meters. Yeah. If it looks good on the back of the camera, like we were saying, Hun yep. 100%. Which was a seconding? What? Seconic. Seconic, yeah, it was a seconic. good stuff. Yeah, so I think it's like, you know, you need to start somewhere, obviously, you know, make sure you get a good camera or a decent camera, but uh, the tools are only as good as what you make of it. Um, for me, if I feel like I'm on a shoot, I'm like, oh man, like I could have used this. 
and then you find yourself in a position where you're like, all right, cool, I definitely would use this, then you're then by all means make the investment. Yeah. You know? Too many times you might go, oh, just buying for the convenience and spending the money for the sake of it. When yeah. You may not, and then that may just sit there for months on end and you never use it, yeah. you know? So that would be, yeah, my tip is just like, know, knowing when to pull the trigger and, you know, cause you can go out and buy the best camera and it could just sit there and do yeah. nothing, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll say once I started building a bit of a collection, I'd buy for convenience slash workflow mm. rather than image quality. So I've got the crappiest 50 millimeter prime lens as we were talking about earlier. I don't think any of my clients could tell the difference between that and the G Master 1.2 that costs five times as much. I think if we gave them a side by side and pointed out the differences, they could see them. But if you just give them a sick shot done at 50 mil, they'll love it. Yeah. So I'm sort of optimizing for, okay, let's upgrade my computer so I can edit faster and I don't get frustrated so I enjoy editing more. I also get the footage back to them sooner, which they do notice. So I feel like if you went and got the expensive lens and then I got some more RAM and hard drives mm. instead of doing that upgrade, they would love me more because assuming we got the same shot, yeah. they can't tell f1.2 from f1.8, yeah. but they can tell that I got back to them quicker. Plus yeah. I'm not burning out because I'm not pissed off at my computer while yeah. it's slowing down rendering and exporting and stuff. So I've been optimizing there, like I'll get time code because now I can just sync up all these cameras super easy. And now this is easier than me having to like manually line up footage based on audio and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, yeah. I've been optimizing for workflow, which I guess is easier to do once you've got all the basic gear, but it's just yeah. something to consider. Yeah, no, I think the further I sort of get into this, you're right, it's about an optimization of your workflow, yeah, right? Like it's, there's no point getting the $10,000 camera if you've got a $1,500 laptop that can't even like, read a file, yeah. you know what I mean? So it's, um, <clears throat> yeah, I think it's just finding those the, the place. For me, like, I made a big investment in flashes, probably the same as you, yeah, like, yeah. because that's what the industry standard was, and that's what, I, and I still use them today, but like, that's what I needed to do because lights weren't good. Yeah. You know, 10 years ago, five years ago, lights, you couldn't take a light, like a powered constant light, shoot photography and shoot videography at the same time. Yeah. Now, I'd rather make the investment in a big light Yeah. that I can go, cool, we can run video and photo at the same time. Okay, so that's absolutely 100% workflow. You're yeah, not toggling 100%. between flashing constant. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, perfect. So it's, um, and, and that's, just some, that's just part of the process, like understanding that and what, what the client wants. And unfortunately, everybody wants something done yesterday. So. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Do you want to do 30 seconds of shameless self-promotion? Tell everyone where they can find you and all that kind of stuff? Sure. Um, Ash T. Jackson on all my socials. That's Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn. <laughs> okay. I You're think, more professional than me, uh, sir. I don't use LinkedIn. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's uh, um, everything's on, on my Instagram. You can check out my portfolio if you want. Uh, but yeah, all my daily stuff is all kept up to scratch on there, so. Yeah. yeah, what's your favorite platform for producing? Probably YouTube. Yeah. Um, as you know, like I'm trying to make a massive effort in YouTube this year. That's uh, kind of been a goal of mine is to just become a better storyteller. And I, th I feel like um, understanding long form format is uh, just pretty crucial in today's age because you're trying to keep someone's attention for longer than 10 seconds. Yeah, you, anybody can make a 10 second ADD cut yeah. thing. And I feel like when my wife's scrolling for hours, she doesn't remember what video she saw two minutes ago. Like it might've been some hype reel, but it's sort of wasted and that it's had no impact on it. Whereas yeah. if you sit down and watch a 10 minute YouTube video about something, you've actually learned, like assuming it's good content, but yeah. you've actually learned something or, or, or been it, truly entertained. It's not just a distraction. Some, yeah, taking something away from it. like. Um, I feel like for me, like that storytelling aspect, like I'd much rather feel invested in it than go, oh cool, we're just flicking through stuff. But the stuff that I'm flicking through, like I need to be invested in that as well. Like yeah. where it's like a brand that has like a consistent theme or story with them that I really yeah. enjoy as well. So yeah, I mean, uh, YouTube, YouTube's gonna be the platform that I'm like, I'm the most interested in pushing myself in. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and then recommend three creators on YouTube that you like following. Ooh, uh, at the moment, Life of Rizzo, she is phenomenal. Yeah. Like just, um, her stuff is 
is just great. Her storytelling is awesome, and she. I'd never heard of her until yeah. you linked me yeah. as your inspiration today. I'm like, oh damn, this yeah. is amazing. Yeah, yeah. she's yeah, um, good she's call. she's phenomenal. Um, I'm actually really enjoying uh, Shervin Shares, who is housemates or used to be housemates with Life of Riz's boyfriend. Yeah, uh, but he's into like fitness and tech and like building That's out. That's us, 100. Yeah, yeah, building out like the healthiest home that he can using smart tech. I think he dropped yeah. a video today about the new Apple Vision Pro. All right, I'm glad I asked you this because I've never heard of this yeah, person. He, now I have some new people to it, follow. It's yeah. kind of um, like, it's, yeah, it's it's just, it's really interesting because he's not, um, he's kind of like an everyday guy and he's got like obviously the tech knowledge. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's super cool. Heaps of stuff about like Apple-based products and yeah. health products if you're into that sort of stuff. I never knew I needed a cooling blanket bed yeah. until I watched his stuff. Okay, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and then probably like a tie between two of my mates or uh, probably a tie between two of uh, two of my peers, uh, Mitch Lally and Carlo O'Brien. Because oh, I, I follow Mitch Lally. I've followed him for years because yeah. he, he shoots Fuji. Yeah. I've so, never met him, but I knew he was, he's in Brisbane, right? Yeah, he's yeah. in Brisbane. Um, I've met Mitch a few times. Um, his videos are so chill. Yeah. Like I just, I get vibes. Like, there's knowledge in there, mm. so it's not just vibes, but like it's a good vibes to knowledge breakdown and his portrait photos are amazing. Yeah, Mitch is like, he's a phenomenal photographer, phenomenal videographer, great storyteller, um, you know, and he uses all the equipment, Canon, Fuji, Sony, like all of it. And like he, it's not over technical, you know. He he's wants, not too gear focused. No, he's here not, for photos, not yeah, cameras. Yeah, he wants to really show you the story you can tell in photos and in video. And Carlo, him and Carlo are like I don't know, good mates. Okay. They're, they're like best friends and they do a lot of stuff together. So you might have seen him in some of his videos. Yeah, yeah but Carlo, same thing. Um, great photographer, great videographer, great yeah. storytelling. And I just, yeah, they're, they're both they're both awesome. Sweet. Yeah. Awesome recommendations. No. Thanks, man. Oh, no, thank you for having me. Awesome. Cut. <laughs> what do I do with my hands? <laughs>